And we here are truly in a wonderful position with respect to other countries. But mixed with this, right, you know, this dream, American dream, is the notion, the, the, the feeling, the drive of greed that the American dream also includes the amassing of money that many of us uh, could regard the success of the American dream by, by the measure of how much money we have made. But the money, while it enables one to enjoy and enjoy much satisfaction, there comes a point where this line goes down. The more money, the less satisfaction. The more money, the less ability to enjoy. The more money, the less the, the communication back between others and yourself of love. The less ability to enjoy the love, the trust. Because the more money you have, you start to think, does this person love me because of my money? Can I buy money? Can I buy love? And these ideas change the interaction between people, between the people who are the successful dream representatives of the American dream. Anyhow, I don't want to spend too much time on this subject, but uh, it's something to, that philosophers need to work on to have a philosophy of satisfaction that would help us all integrate our lives a little better, a little better. So potential is an important thing, not just in human affairs, but in the universe. We need a philosophy of potential. Potential exists as a real uh, thing in, in, um, in the universe. Consider two computers for a moment. One, a little one and a big one. You ask them the same question. What is two and two? The both will say four. But the computing power of the big computer is that much greater. So potentially, it might have given us a different answer, having considered higher mathematics and, and so forth, and different kinds of uh, systems of counting and what, you know, many things. Uh, it might have considered and might have given us considerations. A little computer could not. So it had a potential. A little computer did not. Same thing is true of people. If you meet someone on the street and say, hello, how are you? And they reply, I say, oh, fine. Now, if you say the same to, to a person, you know, not everybody, but if you happen to meet an Einstein walking on the street and say the same thing, and he will say the same answer, it doesn't mean the same, because he could have said many, many things. We conjecture that a more, quotes, ordinary person, if I may use that word, um, would not. So the potential is different of the same question answered in life. In the universe, potential is an important part of existence. But we have not really looked at it that much that way. In the universe, when oxygen meets hydrogen, in an appropriate way, then water has to, has to form. The potential of water has been there. Question. How does potential relate to randomness? Potential decreases entropy. It increases the probability of an improbability. <laughs> it eventually promotes life. 
It, exchange, it exchanges freedom for structure. The atom of oxygen and hydrogen were free to move around in space, anyway. But when they met, by chance, by randomness, they meet, they cling together. It's, uh, as it were, the potential has been there all the time. So they cling together. Take me a uh, different direction now. Uh, what is the probability of photons, or of a photon, to exist? We have made slaves of them. Slaves that work for us without pay, no unions, untiringly, no pay. They don't complain. Electrons, too, in this very presentation. With lots of electrons. Millions, maybe billions, I don't count them. And photons, photons are all around us all the time. We, we're in a, in, in a sea of photons, which we ignore. We see everything we see. And there's everything we don't see, the, the heat, you know, all our radio waves, everything, the photons even here from the very primordial original Big Bang. Still here after 14, approximately 14 billion years. They travel here. Then we come to time, time. 14 billion years, a long time, right? But not if you, in the Gedanken experiment, sit on a photon. You arrive here, in theory, instantly from the time of the Big Bang. But not instantly, in fact, because there are encounters, near encounters, with various uh, molecules and particles, what have you. So it may take a few hours from the Big Bang for a photon to arrive here if you sit on one in thought. In thought. Um, so that time is. You see, we are so imprisoned in the thought of time and the thought of space. Um, we're just not, not even more than imprisoned because our very existence, um, as, as Eric Kandel, for example, has shown, that the brain, uh, there's a map of, of, of space, space in our brain. The, the, the cells and and and, and um, molecules and connections that represent the idea of space, like Kant, uh, Eric Kandel compares it to the a priori concept that Kant had of space, and he, he according to Kandel, Kant, Kant was very correct because in our brain actually. The concept of space is eluc elucidated for us. So we feel at home in space. But in time, we feel only partially at home because if I say to you uh, a second, you understand that, a minute, an hour, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years maybe. But past, after that, uh, there's no feeling for 100,000 years as compared with a million years as compared with 10 million years, or with 100 million years, let alone billion years. We don't have a natural feeling for that scale of uh, time. Likewise, on the short side of time, we're also limited to about a millisecond. Microsecond is already beyond our feeling uh, experience, but we know even that's a long time compared to some processes we're studying now that are a million times faster than a microsecond. So we're at home in the universe in a very limited way insofar as our capacities of time and space are concerned. <laughs>